close to 13,000 members of the United Auto Workers, some of whom you can see on the screen behind me, are on strike since Friday this week, trying to correct long-standing wrongs and demand fair wages and working conditions. How will this massive mobilization impact the industry and the labor movement in the United States? And the G77 plus China grouping, which represents over 130 countries and 80% of the world's population, met in the Cuban capital Havana on Friday and Saturday. In the context of an increasingly multipolar world, will the grouping succeed in its push to restructure international financial architecture to meet the needs of the global south? These are the questions we are asking our reporters on this episode of The Daily Debrief, coming to you from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. Before we go any further, I'd like to take this chance to ask you to subscribe to our channel and of course like and share this show. First up, over 12,000 workers of the United Auto Workers, a union that in total represents about 150,000 workers in the United States auto industry, are on a phased and targeted strike action at plants belonging to auto giants General Motors, Ford and Stellantis. They have slowed the production of cars by, by the big three by as much as 15% already. The union's old contracts with the three manufacturers, manufacturers expired on Thursday and the strike is likely to expand with no agreement between the companies and the unions on the card so far. Reports on the ground indicate that there may be some movement over the weekend, but with the gap in demands between what's being offered by the companies, uh, who have of course made record profits since being on the brink of disappearance following the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, the gaps are still huge and it seems more likely than not that the strike will only gain momentum. This is the latest round of industrial action uh, that also reflects the growing strength of the labor unions in the United States and the desperation faced by the working class, which is precipitating increasingly militant labor actions. Let's go over to Anish to understand the factors that have brought the auto industry to this point and also the potential impact of this massive strike action. Anish, this is of course the big story we are covering today. Uh, <clears throat> tell us first, uh, uh, quite a bit has been of course already covered on this subject in terms of how the strategy of the union this time is different. They're targeting uh, three major manufacturers and are also looking to phase the strike out to maximize its impact uh, as well as reduce the burden on their own, I suppose, strike fund uh, as well as the workers who will be striking. Yes, so at the current uh, moment, we have about 13,000 uh, workers of the about 146 or so thousand uh, workers striking. Uh, and that is, a, uh, you know, a, a tactic that is uh, not new, obviously, but it definitely is a warning sign to the the, the big three uh, automakers that they do not come to a conclusion, uh, the strike will expand and that will be about close to 150,000 uh, people striking and completely stopping work and, you know, bringing pretty much more than half of the uh, U.S. automotive industry to a halt, and that is something uh, that is going to be quite serious. So this is definitely just a peek into what the automakers can actually expect in the coming weeks if uh, they are not uh, willing to engage with the union in a good faith bargaining. Uh, the the major impact it is going to have is definitely there is there are multiple pre pre pressures on the big three, and uh, it's not just the market but also the fact that. Uh, right now, you have uh, electronic vehicle uh, industry being a ma major, uh, you know, player in the entire sector, and these three are trying to catch up to it. And uh, obviously, they are trying to make it seem as if, like, the ununionized uh, factories like Tesla are doing better because uh, obviously they do not have unions. But that is not the reason why they have competitive advantage. I mean, like that might primarily. Uh, that might be partly true, but like a big part of that is a different thing altogether. The fact that they have not invested uh, or made timely investment into in creating or you know manufacturing their own line of electric vehicles, uh, and instead, uh, in fact, have a history of actually bringing down electric vehicles and you know sabotaging efforts towards that is a different fact. Uh, that is that they do not want to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, uh, the workers are bringing to question a lot of things, a lot of 
things that are considered taken for granted in the industry, especially how uh, the workers are treated. Uh, and uh, the fact that the big three completely forgot about the actual real, you know, very generous concessions that workers made in 2008 when all three of them uh, were in doldrums, uh, financially speaking, uh, were uh, facing something close to bankruptcy at the time. And they had to, and workers actually made concessions to, uh, to allow for these companies to keep their competitive advantage and to, you know, to become, you know, one of the biggest uh, profit-making uh, factories and companies in the world right now. Yeah, uh, which brings us to, I, I guess, quite naturally, the next part of the conversation. Uh, I, I was listening to a senior executive of General Motors talking about how uh, they are frustrated by, uh, you know, the, the breakdown in negotiations despite offering what they are saying a la is a landmark uh, new contract. Uh, but workers on the other, other hand, uh, Anish, are saying that these companies, like you were saying, have had record profits and, and which should result in uh, similar record contracts. And, and the kind of increases they are asking are just in line with what uh, executives or management <coughs> positions have received anyway. So, so uh, how do you balance out these two arguments? <clears throat> there is no need to balance out. The fact is that the facts stand uh, on the side of the workers at this point in time. Uh, the, since 2008 uh, and until last year, uh, CEOs and executives of these three companies have actually made close to 40% uh, increase in their salaries. That's a record margin hike uh, at a time when workers uh, Workers who actually make and use these uh, cars and you know uh, instruments and all of that that goes behind it, all of the process that goes behind it, they are pretty much uh, actually saw a decline of nearly about uh, twenty percent, you know, close to twenty percent, if not exactly that, uh, of their real wages, uh, primarily because of the COVID nineteen pandemic, but also because uh, they they actually gave up in 2008, we must remember that, they, they actually gave up uh, cost of living adjustments uh, so that these companies could have, uh, you know, start making profits and actually uh, with the promise that they would actually give that back to the workers and prioritize their wage increases once they are, you know, they get back to being a profitable business. Yeah. And we must remember that during the pandemic, the three big automakers actually made quite a lot of money. They made record profits, actually. And it wasn't just Tesla that was making money at the time, obviously. Uh, and that is something that they do not want to talk about. Uh, you know, last financial year, uh, we had Ford and GM Motors making close to about $170 billion in revenue. Uh, and uh, Stellantis making about $102 billion in revenue. That's a massive revenue. And obviously, profit margins are huge as well. They have made about, in the last 10 years, about $250 billion in profits alone. And that clearly shows, and obviously, much of that went to servicing investors and you know dividend payments that went to about $65 billion all of them put together. So right. if they do, they, they did have the money. They just may, may prioritize their own salaries, their, their executive salaries, and the dividend payments for uh, investors, uh, rather than actually, uh, you know, hiking, uh, you know, pays, uh, pay investing and you know, working workers. conditions. Exactly, yeah. investing in their own workers, or for that matter, investing in new technology as well. Yeah. They are now yeah. trying to invest in technology because there are competitive edge being taken over by somebody else. And not because uh, there is a need to, they feel, they felt the need to actually create one. So this is something, uh, these are facts that the, the, the strike is actually bringing out. And that's something uh, that the automakers do not really want to talk about, do not want the public to actually engage it. But this is definitely not going to work uh, right now at this point in time because of the, you know, the massiveness of the strike itself and how it is going to impact pretty much everybody, including, you know, the wider economy, the market, supply chains, everything. Yeah, which, which is the point on which we, I suppose, can uh, conclude uh, this little conversation, Anish. Uh, Sean Fain of, of the UAW uh, saying that this is a kind of defining moment for our generation. Uh, and we've also seen over the past couple of years an increasing sort of uh, willingness, participation in organized labor movements, uh, more militant labor movements uh, in the United States. 
how do you see that Im uh, the impact of this strike continuing uh, that kind of that momentum uh, that pressure on employers to actually share these record profits that um, mega companies are making across sectors not just in the united states uh, it is difficult to say how things are going to move from here, but definitely the fact that labor militancy is on the rise is a welcome thing because uh, we must remember that obviously U.S. Uh, had a long history of labor movements, uh, but uh, you know the post neoliberal era, uh, the you know the one world order, and uh, also the unipolar order. Sorry, and also. Uh, the fact that the 2008 crisis happened uh, created a situation where labor movement actually took a back seat, and primarily because traditional labor groups did not really, uh, you know, put their efforts into actually mobilizing, uh, you know, actions that could actually help their workers, uh, and that is now changing because there are now pressures from workers, workers who have faced significant difficulty. We are talking about like automate. Automotive workers are some of the better paid of the blue collar workers in the United States. And if they had had to go through about 20% in real wage loss, uh, we can only imagine what is happening to, you know, the, uh, the lower end of the organized workers. Forget the unorganized workers in, say, the food, the fast food industry or the retail industry. Mm -hmm. So this is a very different situation that uh, the U.S. Uh, workers and the working class have found themselves in. Many of them, obviously coming from uh, different racial minorities and national minorities uh, who also have to, you know, who stay in that poverty levels in some ways uh, because they really can't make enough to make ends meet. And this is something that is reflected in also the demands. The 40% uh, demand might seem quite drastic and it would it would look like to, uh, you know, an average bystander who may not have any idea of what is happening that a 20 percent uh, as suggested I, as suggested by the companies is generous but mm -hmm. it is not and when you consider the fact that the CEOs themselves have given themselves uh, about 40 percent of uh, an increase very generously they can do the same with workers so this is not something that is up for debate for the workers or for the trade unions uh, the fact that they need to make uh, if they have to keep their competitive edge they have to actually start investing in their workers start uh, giving them overtime, start giving them uh, enough rest, leaves, with something, all of which were completely forsaken by these workers so that these companies could stay uh, afloat. And right. that generosity needs to be repaid. That cannot be, uh, you know, replaced at any level, no matter what the executives say. And that is something that the workers want to really highlight at the moment. All right. Thanks, uh, Anish, for that update on a strike that is uh, just about uh, starting off gathering uh, momentum. We'll, of course, uh, ask you to keep tracking uh, developments uh, in the U.S. Uh, as things proceed. And, of course, uh, like with everything else, this will also connect back to the 2024 presidential election. Uh, so we'll also wait and see what the impact is on that. And our second story on the show today is uh, that in the Cuban capital, Havana, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, while addressing delegates from over 130 nations of the Global South, admitted to the failings of the post-World War multilateral institutions to address the developmental issues of many of these nations. He was speaking, of course, at the summit of the G77 plus China uh, grouping, which is being hosted by Cuba, uh, and also said that the international financial architecture and Bretton Woods institutions represented a bygone era, with the need for restructuring more urgent than ever before. The grouping is the largest of its kind, representative of 80% of the world's population and in some ways the antithesis or antidote depending on how you look at it to the G7 grouping of the world's most advanced industrialized nations. The idea behind the summit is to push forward a new economic order and create a diplomatic as well as a negotiating block to increase South-South cooperation and pressure on the North, particularly Western countries, to relinquish power, take accountability and put their money where their mouths are. Let's go over to Prashant for more. Uh, Prashant, good to have you on uh, Debrief with us this afternoon. Uh, tell us a bit about what's happening in uh, Cuba, uh, Prashant, some uh, pretty clear language. Uh, looking at the international financial architecture, how the Bretton Woods institutions function and how the interests of the Global South are not being addressed adequately as is clearly visible uh, 
uh, around the world. So tell us what, what kind of conversations are going on and, and what sort of uh, movement is expected from the G77 plus summit. summit. Right, you know, as we record, of course, the summit is not concluded yet, so we haven't yet got the final resolution. But the indications, like you said, uh, look like there's a lot of conversation around some of these subjects about inequity, about the role of the global south and the global north and how development has not really sort of, you know, the kind of development the global south should have had has not really been obtained and that is basically due to the architecture of some of these institutions. But just to take a step back, I think we've been in a season of summit, so to speak. We saw BRICS taking place and we saw uh, G20 taking place. And now we have the G77 plus China meeting taking place. And this is a very interesting platform because you have, although the name says G77, there are actually about more 130 countries that are part of uh, this block, so to speak. And, you know, about 80% of the world's population actually is uh, as is part of this block. So it's actually, in some senses, maybe the biggest grouping, the biggest global grouping of them all, if you look at it in that sense. And while, of course, uh, a couple of things that are important to note is that, uh, of course, this block sometimes does not necessarily get the kind of importance it gets. But this year, especially since Cuba has taken over the presidency, uh, there's, been a, there's been a much more stronger uh, push from the side of the Cubans to actually make the voice heard. And it's very important that this summit is also being held in Havana because uh, there are 30 heads of state uh, taking part. Uh, also, it's a very direct message to the United States, which has imposed these unilateral sanctions and blockade on Cuba, which has really, really <clears throat> you know, affected the economic situation of the country. So in some senses, we're talking about financial architecture, but we're also talking about the geopolit geopolitical architecture, so to speak, of which Cuba has been the number one victim for the past many decades. So it's very significant that the summit is being held in Havana, that, uh, you know, we have uh, leaders from across the world, uh, including BRICS leaders, for instance, both Lula and Ramaphosa are there, I believe, taking part uh, in this summit, uh, leaders from Latin America taking part in this summit, in that way, reiterating uh, their solidarity uh, with the Cubans and even all the others taking place. So that's, I think, a very important context in which this summit is being held. Uh, another important thing I think to note is that the themes also have to do with science, technology, and innovation. That's a very important theme at the summit, which again means that, uh, you know, <clears throat> the key, uh, you know, these are not neutral terms, so to speak, because science and technology, uh, especially as we saw with COVID, are aspects which the global south has been denied access for the longest time due to patents regimes, due to other kinds of discrimination. And <clears throat> the fact that the countries of the global south are actually highlighting this is a very important step to be considered. And now also coming to the question of uh, financial institutions, we've had a lot of talk about this in recent times. And I think this is a sign of uh, a shift that is taking place. Now, the important question is whether the shift will take place fast enough, considering the uh, realities that uh, that exist in today's world, the kind of hunger that exists, the kind of illiteracy and poverty that exists, and the impact of climate change, which is uh, taking, which you're seeing across the world in almost every single country. Uh, is there enough will uh, on the part of the, you know, is there enough will globally to force this kind of change in institutions which are patently unfair, or will these calls for reform just be restricted to paper or small steps which will take a long time? Uh, to be established, so to speak, because it is very it is very clear that there is a very, very urgent need for reform. Countries in the global south cannot be dealing with this kind of debt. We're seeing crisis in countries across the global south. We're talking about Pakistan, we're talking about Argentina, we're talking about, for that matter, uh, say a country like Tunisia. We're talking about so many countries struggling under the stranglehold of institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, basically human development indicators declining in many countries because of issues like this and uh, issues like climate change, for instance, make it much, much worse. So I think this is very high on the agenda. It's no, uh, and for, for that matter, you even have leaders of the global north now paying lip service uh, to many of these uh, themes. But I think the fundamental question is that will this reform take place uh, fast enough uh, considering the urgent requirement there is? Right. Uh Prashant, the Secretary General of the United Nations is also attending uh, this uh, this conference, and and had some pretty clear words uh, for uh, or, or along the same lines of reform that you were talking about, uh, including his own organization, the United Nations Security Council. Uh, is one of uh, the hopes that uh, this block, this massive block of 130 plus countries, will be able to kind of band together and and put forward uh, a, a united voice on uh, many of these major issues that will also come up at the United Nations in the coming week? 
Right, so that's a very important question. I think one place where we have seen these countries work together quite effectively is in the various COP summits. We know that uh, the, the pressure exerted by these countries played a huge role in uh, the loss and damage fund that was approved last year. But nonetheless, again, this is still uh, needs to be enacted in practice. The practical details are still uh, to be decided. And I think that is where a lot of these issues finally come up. The key question of, you know, when it comes to the exact, the, the point of enacting reform in concrete terms, uh, how, you know, what is the position of the countries in the global north, which still have enormous leverage on many of these countries? Uh, you know, will they try to divide? Will they try to exert pressure? Or will they try to cooperate considering the situation of the world right now? And as of now, we have actually not seen too many positive signs uh, from the global north when it comes to many of these issues. So I think it's a very tough question right now because, uh, you know, we are seeing a consolidation in the global south. There's no question of it. There is a very strong anti, for lack of a better word, anti-colonial, anti-neocolonial mood that has seized many of the countries of the global south. Even countries of the global south, which are, which are close to the west, are realizing that, are recalibrating the strategies at various points of time. You know, the question of when it comes to the question of sanctions, when it comes to the question of debt, when it comes to the question of climate change funding, in all of these issues, countries of the global south are banding together much, much more than before. But many of these uh, fora, it is not enough just to have the numbers, there is a need for consensus, and there is also a need ultimately for, uh, you know, funding to be uh, provided. There's also a need for finances to be uh, shared, so to speak. And that, that, I think, is really where all this talk, the, where all this talk gets exposed or where, all, where, where the reality check comes in. So I think and, you know, in the coming weeks, as we see these UN meetings, it's very important to see how much of this is a vague declaration saying that we are all on the same team, we are all for the future of this planet, and how much of it is uh, concrete and structural changes, let's be clear. We're not just talking only about money or you know, a one-time infusion of funds for a certain project or something of that sort. We are talking about the possibility, the question of structural change itself to various institutions. Uh, will the United States continue to have the kind of veto power it has over the International Monetary Fund? You know, uh, Will uh, the IMF, for instance, continue those same kind of policies which alert countless countries into ruin? Will the United Nations become far more representative of the kind of global uh, you know, the kind of global order that is today. All of these are, I think, very, you know, maybe medium to long term uh, questions as well. But I think uh, each each of these summits provides an interesting signpost uh, in that direction. All right. Thanks, uh, Prashant. We'll leave it there for today. And that wraps up our coverage of the news beyond the headlines on Daily Debrief for this week. We'll be back with another episode on Monday. Until then, we take the opportunity to invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and also remind you, to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.